Thank you for coming to this fuzzing session of the security uh, track of uh, KubeCon Chicago 2023. This is a first introduction and OSS first demo. Uh, my name is Adam Kuczynski. This is David. Uh, we are from uh, Ada Logix and we do a lot of fuzzing in general uh, and a lot of fuzzing on of CNCF projects. Um, and this is uh, more of a practical uh, approach to fuzzing um, and should have a lot of, uh, we, we have a lot of examples and uh, uh, practical how-tos to get started and to, to get started with fuzzing and triaging your findings, uh, etc. The agenda, we'll talk about uh, the CNCF fuzzing ecosystem. There are a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff going on for the CSTF projects specifically, um, but there are a lot of resources and materials available for uh, the open source uh, community as a whole. Um, so if you're not a CNCF project, this is also for you. Uh, then uh, we'll do, do a little in intro on how to force a software, uh, software project. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave, um, I'll, I'll get to, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, and then the fuzzing life cycle. So what, what happens when you have written a fuzzer? What do you do how, what, and how do you do it efficiently? Uh, and OSS fuzz finally, um, which is a big part of the, the fuzzing life cycle. Um, so yeah, uh, fuzzing as a concept is a way to, in essence, stress test applications. And by and large, the goal is to find uh, bugs, both security and reliability issues. And the goal is to, because it's stress testing, we are working with dynamic analysis here, meaning we actually execute the code on the analysis. So what you are doing when you are fussing is you are developing a fusser, and this fusser will call your application essentially infinitely, meaning it will just run forever, either until it stops or until it finds a bug or so. Uh, and when I say it stops, I mean when someone stops it. Uh, so it's just a, a process of stress testing your application over and over again. And in general, the fussing uh, approach that, that, that we use, which is coverage guided fussing, becomes better over time when analyzing a spe specific target. And this is because it relies on what we call like genetic mutational algorithms that builds up a set of test cases where each test case represents, kind of represents a, an input that will execute a unique code path in the target project relative to the other test cases that the first has generated. So that's kind of like the, the short story. I don't want to go into too many of the, of the conceptual details of fuzzing, but the goal is to find bugs, find vulnerabilities. So perhaps importantly to say here, it's not only vulnerabilities it finds, and the way you do that is to execute your application your software over and over again with sort of random input. Um, many projects here are in, in CNCF are, are being fast, including all the ones shown here. Um, and primarily, uh, perhaps it's, it's worth mentioning Envoy and Fluentbit because these were some of the early adopters of fuzzing, primarily because they are written in memory on safe languages. So they're written in C and C++. And this is usually where you, this is where fuzzing kind of originates from because memory corruption issues can have much more severe consequences than say, um, kind of like on exceptions in Python or so. Um, so the CNCF fuzzing ecosystem has kind of like, is, is a relatively small ecosystem in the sense that uh, we have one repository, github.com slash CNCF slash CNCF fuzzing, and you'll find a lot of resources that we, we have for fuzzing CNCF projects there. You'll find audit reports. So the usual approach that we take as a CNCF fuzzing team is we engage with the, with the given CNCF project, the maintainers in this case. We analyze a bit of their threat model, the attack surface, what are the consequences of if something goes wrong when this API are called and so on. And we, we then collaborate with the maintainers to build up a, a, a fuzzing suite which will call the application in many different ways. And a fuzzing suite here is essentially just kind of like fuzzing harnesses, which are unit tests on steroids in a sense. And once we have done this collaboration with the CNCF projects, we write up an audit report that has details of each of the bugs found, the various findings, 
whether box have vulnerabilities or reliability issues. And you can find all these reports in the, uh, the repository shown here, CNCF fuzzing. And um, another key, key, key component in CNCF fuzzing is uh, the project OSS fuzz, which is a service run by Google, uh, which is essentially just a GitHub repository. But the point is that you place some files in this repository that builds the fuzzes of your given project. So Istio will have a project folder on OSS Fuzz. Envoy will have a project folder on OSS Fuzz. And OSS Fuzz will, Google will then build your software and run it in the cloud and report to you if there are any, any issues found. The importance is here that they will do it on a daily basis. So you develop a fuzzer, you put it up on this repository, and then they'll run it for the next 10 years or as long as they keep it going. And this is really central to the way we fuss in CNCF because we help write the harnesses and then we let the maintainers take, take over as much as possible. We'll give you, uh, so OSS is, is a really key here in the ecosystem and we'll give you some examples of, of what it can do uh, later. So we, I just wanna give a small shout out because we just released a fussing handbook that goes into what is fussing, how to fuss in various languages. So in this case, C and C++, Python and Go. And then it also has a sort of thorough guide to assess first an end-to-end walkthrough uh, showing various details that you don't really find in the, in the documentation of OSS first and gives a very pragmatic approach to how you can um, integrate into OSS first. Um, and if you are a maintainer out there, uh, a CNCF project maintainer out there, it's worth mentioning that once you integrate into OSS first, you uh, can also claim a, a bounty and get a reward for actually submitting a project and, and, and enrolling in OSS first. So uh, a, a small shout out there, uh, you can check the, the, there's a link to the handbook. Um, with that, I'll pass it over to Adam. Yeah, so this, this is a small walkthrough of, um, of fuzzing, uh, of writing a fuzzer and running it, um, starting with how, how we write a fuzzer. Um, and David mentioned that we, we do, what, what we do with CNCF fuzzing is we, 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 David and I, write a bunch of fuzzers for the CNCF projects and hand it over to, um, to, the CNC, to the respective CNCF projects. And at that moment, it's a great thing if the project takes the fuzzing further, uh, adopts it, maintains it, um, and uh, uh, perhaps like write, write their own um, fuzz harnesses in the future. So this, this is a smaller intro to uh, how that process lo looks like. You need four things to uh, fuss essentially at, at a high level. Uh, you have a piece of code that you want to test for bugs and vulnerabilities. Um, you have a fuzzing engine that generates the test cases that, uh, that David uh, mentioned in the intro. Um, and you have a fuzz harness, that's the test that you write as the developer. Um, and Finally, you need time to run the fuzzer. It needs to run uh, independently. Again, David mentioned this in the, uh, in the intro. Here we have an example of a harness. Uh, this is a harness for the Knative project, uh, testing um, uh, this uh, admit method um, and of the config validation controller. Uh, what we do here, uh, this is a little more of an, an advanced example um, but what we do here is that we create an admission request uh, and randomize it and pass it to this admit uh, method to see if the admit method somehow uh, crashes in when when executing or being passed is being passed uh, some sort of weird uh, admission request. And you can see here in the bottom, this fossil lives in uh, the CNCF fossing repository. Let's, let's try to, uh, to look at how fossing explores code. As you recall, David in the intro mentioned that uh, part of an, an important component of fossing is that fossing explores the code that it tests, which is why we need for, uh, time to run the fossil to, to a fossil that we have written to give it time to explore the, the target application. Um, so let's look at how fuzzing uh, does that. So let's say here, we, we on, the, on the right side, we have a piece of code that we want to test for bugs and vulnerabilities. Fairly simple um, piece of code that uh, do, does a, a, a series of checks uh, against a string and uh, returns true if the string finally is equal to um, 
A, B, C, D in lowercase. So we have our fuzzing engine, and typically as a developer, we don't really do much with the fuzzing engine uh, at a high level except for except of choosing it. Um, but what the fuzzing engine does is that when when we write our harness, it gives us uh, the it and when we run that harness, the, the fuzzing engine is in charge of generating the test cases that we receive in our test harness. So I'll just quickly go back here to, to this uh, Knative example. Um, in, the, in the top here, we see that th this is the test case that the fuzzing engine generates for us. And we, it's passed to our fuzz harness as a parameter, a data here, a, a byte slice. Um, and it's our job in the fuzz harness to pass that test case onto the code that we are testing. So as you see here, the engine gives the, uh, passes a test case, input test case to the fuzz harness, and the fuzz harness's job is to pass that onto the um, code that we are testing. So let's say that we, we have written our harness and we run it. Um, now the engine will generate uh, it test cases at a very high speed. So, so but let's let's take one, let's take take an example and zoom in on a few uh, of those uh, test cases that the fuzzing engine will generate. So it, let's say that the, the fuzzing engine uh, generates a test case that is zero zero zero. Um, on the right side, we see that the the code that we are testing. Um, well, this, this test case will explore the first branch of the code that we are testing uh, as shown, because the, it's not uh, four, uh, it doesn't have a length of four, so it returns in the four, first branch here. Next, the, the fuzzing engine um, is able to, after maybe a few a thousand uh, executions, is able to generate a test case of four zeros. Um, and is, is able to pass or get past the first uh, length check there. So it, it goes into the second branch there um, and returns because the first uh, character of the byte or the first byte is not in uh, lowercase a. Or, uh, sorry, the first, um, first character of the string is not in lowercase a. So the, fuzz, the fuzzing engine uh, is able to, at a, at a later uh, point in the, uh, uh, when running, is able to generate A, three, three zeros, and is uh, able to get past the first um, branch and return the, uh, sorry, in, get past the second branch and return the third, and so forth. And the, uh, in that way, the fuzzing engine is able to get the feedback that it uh, receives from the um, from exploring the code and generate meaningful test cases. So essential component is, in this example is the fuzzes rely on generating random data. But as you see in this, in this function, there are four bytes the fuzzer has to guess. That's 32 bits. If you are to generate a test case that gets down to the return true statement, you have to guess one out of two to 32. The fuzzer, based on the coverage feedback, reduces this significantly by each time it passes a condition. It saves that test case and puts it in what we call its corpus. Now, the point is then, in the next time the fuzzer runs, it picks one of the test cases from the corpus, mutates it, and then tries that. So instead of having to guess one in two to 32, it has to guess four times one in Two, two, one out of 256 because a byte is only eight bits. So that's the central component here. Each time we get past one condition, we get past A, we save that test case. We have, it took one out of 256 guesses to find, that, to find the test case that would pass the first condition. We then save that corporate and we only have to guess one out of 256 again. One out of 256 again. So that's the central component here. We, it reduces the complexity the coverage feedback mechanism because it knows which code was executed. That's the central com component here. It's, it's random, but because of the co coverage feedback, you don't have to have these huge complexities uh, as you might, might would assume. Yeah, I may make a note of the corpus because we will get back to that later uh, when we find, uh, when we go into how we um, uh, reproduce a crash that the fossils find. So uh, let's say that we have written our fuzzer and we, 
Uh, wait, let, let's say that we have written our fossa and we want to test them. So we write our fossas and we submit them uh, to a project. Uh, in this case, we actually con contribute them to a, an open source project, for example, a CNCF project, um, uh, and, and make a pull request, pull request, get them merged upstream. When this project wants to run these fossas, it can do so in three ways. It can do it in the CI, it can do it continuously, or the developers can run them locally. And all of these uh, typically uh, happen um, when, when you force a project. So let's talk about the CI. Uh, let's talk about why and how of each of these uh, three ways of running the forces. When you force in the CI, the, the typical uh, reason you would do that is to uh, have a bunch of forces that test the code uh, for box in that box that the PRs introduce. So you want to catch box in PRs because before the code is merged. Another good reason is also that you, you want to ensure that you don't break your fossa build or your fossas in general. So you if you have 70 fossas, you don't want to merge a single fossa that uh, break all the other fossas from and prevent them from running. How? Uh, a, good, a good way to run in the CI is uh, either, yeah, as I mentioned, in, in PRs before they are merged, uh, part of the, 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 the workflows, or uh, you can do it uh, continuously in the CI with a project like Clusterforce Lite, which um, we will get into, well, it, Clusterforce Lite is kind of a forcing framework that autom automates a lot of stuff, uh, and that, that, is, uh, that runs continuously uh, in your CI. Um, or you can, if you, are, if you have a project that's integrated into OSSFOS, you can use CIFOS, uh, which is also a tool for, which is basically a GitHub action um, that you uh, just add to your GitHub workflows folder. Uh, continuously, uh, we, we touched upon it, con fussing continuously in the CI, but let's talk about fussing continuously in the background. Um, and, and why, uh, yeah, again, why and how, um, you want to, first of all, you want to ensure that your fossas actually run. It happens a lot that you, a, a project will write a bunch of fossas, really excellent fossas as well, and forget about them and they won't run. Um, and I have personally seen cases where uh, simply uh, running, get, getting these fossas to run have found security issues. Uh, another reason is that Fossas, some might some forces might need a lot of time to explore code, um, and uh, and get past. Uh, in the example we saw that the fossa uh, in fossa needed to get past a bunch of branches. These branches may sometimes be very complicated and uh, difficult to not difficult. They might might require time to get past. Um, so fussing continuously means that the forces will have enough or plenty of time to to do so. Um, and yeah, three, um, uh, that's what, what I just said. Uh, how? Um, OSSFOS, Clusterfoss Lite. Uh, OSSFOS is an open source project. David introduced, I think uh, no need to go into that, but here's the link if you want to read more about that. Uh, I strongly suggest um, uh, uh, looking up on it. We will go, uh, we will do some demos on it uh, in, a, in a bit. Testing locally. Um, is the, with, testing locally is mainly when you want to, uh, when you're developing fossils and you, you, uh, yeah, you want to make sure they run, you want to perhaps, uh, like when you're making contributions to a, to a project, you want to ensure that you're not introducing bugs yourself. Fuzzing locally is always an in intermediary step for fuzzing continuously. It, it's not a replacement for con uh, fuzzing continuously. Uh, the goal is to get the fuzzers to run um, uh, continuously. And um, locally, when you fuzz locally, you, uh, you kind of ensure that the, that they can, the fuzzers can also run continuously. Uh, how? Uh, yeah, use a... Uh, uh, you can you either compile your the fossas um, into binaries and run invoke them on your command line, or you you use some kind of CLI, which is what the Golang, uh, which which is what Golang enables through their um, through their test uh, uh, CLI uh, tool. 
So I uh, want to go back to fuzzing continuously a bit more, uh, having gone through all of these three ways of running. Let's go look a bit deeper into fuzzing continuously because it's very important. Um, it's a very important component and part of fuzzing. Fuzzing continuously has uh, a, a few problems and difficulties. Um, if you, you might, you, if typically you will have a bunch of fuzzers that require different, uh, different amounts of time to run. You might have a fuzzer that tests 1,000 lines of code and you might have a fuzzer that tests 20,000 lines of code. Naturally, you should give more time to the fuzzer that tests uh, 20,000 lines of code. Not naturally, but most likely you should. Um, the more fuzzers you write, uh, the more complex it becomes to run these fuzzers uh, continuously. Uh, it, it requires uh, more effort to manage uh, 100 fuzzers than two fuzzers, um, and doing that in an automated way it can be complex. You want to reuse the corpus. Um, jumping back to the, to the points made by David and myself about the code exploration, let's say uh, David mentioned the corpus. Um, let's say that your fuzzer has found a way uh, to or has generated a seed that gets all the way to the, uh, to, or, or that gets deep into the code, you want to take that seed and use it to start your next fuzz run, so, such that you start the fuzzer not from scratch again, and it has to spend a bunch of time to find the same seed. You want to take that seed and uh, start, it, uh, start the next, next fuzz run with that seed. Then the, the fuzzers might find crashes, and uh, you might fix those cra you, crashes, hopefully. Um, and that also, re that also uh, requires uh, some, some, uh, uh, some effort to, to, get, to get the details from the fuzz runs and not, forget, like, not lose them in, in your logs, for example. And because of that, amongst other things, Google, or the Google, Google or Salesforce project is a uh, um, it's a great uh, open source project for, for fuzzing. It's, it's a critical component of, component of open source fuzzing. Okay. Um, going through that. The workflow. Um, this is a diagram of, the, of OSS Fuzz. Let's, let's look at more into OSS Fuzz. Uh, this is the workflow uh, from the Dapper uh, fuzzing audit. Uh, this is also public in, in the Dapper fuzzing audit report. Uh, but here we see the fuzzing, uh, the, how OSS fuzz works. On the left side, we have the fuzzers sitting in uh, CNCF fuzzing that gets pulled into OSS fuzz uh, at build time. Then we have the target source files in the top that also get pulled in. Then OSS fuzz builds those and over here, over here, and run the fuzzers for a couple of uh, executions and check if, if any of the uh, previous uh, bugs are found. If they are, uh, sorry, if, not, not if, if any of the previous found box are fixed. If they are, uh, they, OSS will update uh, a central bug, bug tracker. And if they are not, um, maintainers, OSS will check next time. Um, you see a lot of the, uh, stuff going on here, uh, and OSS automates that um, for, for the project integrated. There are three key components of OSS for us, a Docker file, a build sh file, a project.yaml file. The Docker file is, okay. This is uh, the Istio project. Uh, David will get more into that, just uh, highlighting them here. Uh, there are three key commands of OSS for us, uh, build image, build fuzzers, run fuzzer. Um, the build image says the, builds the, the, the environment for, for building the fuzzers, build fuzzers, build the binaries um, so we can run them later and run fuzzer will run a fuzzer for us. And if you are contributing to fuzzers to a project that's integrated into a Zesfuzz, these commands are great to know. So let's do a small demo, uh, almost live demo. I made it this morning, uh, but uh, we, we do pull, pull in a lot of packages. so. Uh, uh, I wanted to do, to do a live demo, but uh, we, internet uh, Wi-Fi is not super strong. So what we do here is, for all the way from scratch, we clone the OSS for repository, highlighting uh, basically A to Z of uh, building the fuzzers and running them. 
uh, we, we CD into the OSS uh, directory that we just cloned, and we build the image of the Istio fuzzers. Now we have built the image and it's time to build the fuzzers. Istio has close to 70 fuzzers, uh, so this takes a while. I have uh, increased the speed here uh, by quite a lot, I think 20 times. Um, so uh, just speeding through that. Or maybe I haven't. Um, but just skipping through here for time purposes. This is all uh, the process of building the faucet here of Istio. And at some, pi so at some point, uh, it finishes. And here, the, we, have, we are fi finishing building the fossils. We have still only run build image and build fossils. And we want to check the, uh, which fossils we have built. These are all binaries. These are all the fos built fossils of Istio. And now let's uh, run a fossil. So we invoke run fossil Istio and the fossil name. Here we choose one of these here, uh, the green ones here. And the fossa is running. And the, uh, these three command commands were all you needed uh, to, to get that done. The demo just did that. So what about when a fossa finds a crash? Uh, it's, part of, it's an important part of uh, fuzzing, why, why we do it. Um, we, when OSS source finds a crash uh, by running one of our fuzzers, we get a, a, an email with a link to a report like, like so. On the left side, you see who, which, which people receive or which emails received uh, this bug report. Um, these are all defined in the project.yaml file uh, of, the, of the OSS source integration uh, that we, we mentioned a few moments, moments ago. And here we have a link to the detailed report. So let's, go th uh, let's click into that and we see Okay. So uh, Adam was just about to show you how uh, the bug reports look on OSS first, but I'm gonna give you a live example of that um, just to show you how it looks while clicking around the browser. So say for example, we have a repository here which contains a CNCF project that we want to fuss. And we have uh, two files here which is just a, a small library in C, just an example library, and we have two fuzzers. So the library we have uh, has a function pass complex input, pass complex format. We want to write a fuzzer for this entry point into our CNCF project. The fuzzer that we will write in this case simply looks as follows. This is the entry point that the fuzz engine will call. So this is the core, fun this is the core fuzzing harness we have. The fuzzer will give us a raw buffer as well as the size of this buffer, a, a, a raw buffer of bytes. And what we do is we wrap this raw buffer into a null terminated string and then we pass it to our uh, function pass com complex format. What will happen now is that the fuzz engine will continuously give us a buffer that makes sense and we're trying to see if there are any memory corruption issues into, in the pass complex format. Now, if we are to, so, we want to integrate this into OSS first. And we have here a pull request. So all of this, by the way, you can find in the handbook. We have an example that, that goes through this. But here we make the pull request into the OSS first repository. You can see we are at the OSS first repository and we make a OSS first example um, initial integration. And we have here the Docker file Adam, Adam spoke of, the build as well as the project YAML. And the Docker file, the only thing it does is it inherits from the uh, Google uh, provided base images, which has a lot of like fussing um, uh, intrinsics tools and so on that you need, the right compilers and so on. And then you just clone your repository so we have it inside the Docker file. What we then do is we build the code of our library in a certain way. And in this case, we have to use various environment variables which correspond to the, the compiler we want to use as well as the flags to the compiler. The key is here that these flags they indicate various information we need to provide to the compiler that tells it instrument the code 
instrument the code in a manner that is suitable for fuzzing. And this includes instrumenting for code coverage feedback as well as sanitizers such as address sanitizer and so on. And then we build our fuzzers against this uh, library we have just uh, compiled. Now, this was accepted, so it was merged in, we can see, and now we actually have a, a OSS, for example, inside the projects folder of OSS. First. What then happens is, so this happened on the 7th of August. The, we, in the project YAML, we had a field that said, let's file, let's file GitHub issues, meaning when OSS first finds an issue, we get a bug report on our GitHub tracker. So now we are back in our OSS first example repository. Our OSS first project was made the 7th of August. The 8th of August, we got a notification that an issue has been found. It tells us OSS first has found a bug, a bug in this project. Please see this link for details. So we try and go into this link. And what we get is this bug report. So what you see here is you have the stack trace. First, you see the sanitizer uh, report. There was a heap of overflow. We get the exact line where the error occurs. So in this case, we can see that it's at this index and likely it's just because IDX here is out of bounds. Well, it's because IDX here is out of bounds. We can see what the specific input to the uh, fuzzer is, which it, if it's ASCII, we can see that there is a little key here saying fuzz and then a bunch of stuff. And we can use this test case to also reproduce the issue. So what we then did in our uh, OSS first example uh, project was we tried to fix this issue. And the way we did that was we submitted a, a patch fix bug and the bug was because there was some buffer sizing going wrong. Instead of giving, uh, we, we gave it X, but we should actually give it X divided by two. And this happened on the 10th of August. What then happened in our uh, issue was OSSFOS came back the 11th of August and said, the 11th of August and said, OSSFOS has closed this bug because it's fixed. So this is kind of like the, the nature of OSSFOS. You integrate, you make a pull request on OSS first with your three Docker files, th with your three files, a Docker file, a build, and a project YAML. And then OSS first will simply start to run your build script and run the various fuzzers. So first complex parser that you have here. And as well, we also had one other fuzzer. It will just continuously run these and report whenever any issues are found. It does a lot more than actually just find, just report when issues are found. There's a website here called introspector.ossfuzz.com which shows you data about all projects on OSS first. So for example, it shows that, uh, it shows projects about 960 projects in OSS first, including, uh, and just about one, it shows that just about 1.5 million uh, functions are being analyzed. And what it shows you is, let's look up our example project. What it shows is, uh, first and foremost, you have a code coverage report, so you can, look at the exact lines of code that are being fussed in your project, in any project on OSS first. This is something everybody can access. So we can see here that, for example, our uh, past complex format, uh, this is past complex format second, but our past complex format is executed by 295 unique inputs we can see here. And we can also see what code is not being executed. This is super important when you are sort of like iteratively working on your project in order to get maximum code coverage. So say for example, there is, uh, let's, let's pick on, on a Google project called libwebp, which was, uh, with, there was recently a critical uh, issue in this project. And we can see whether it is actually being fussed well, and we can see that it has uh, a code coverage of 84% which is not 100%, and we can start to look around at where are there potentially uh, limitations in their, uh, in their fussing routines, and we can see, for example, there are some missing coverage of some interesting decoder functions. So this is something where we can start to uh, contribute fussers to libwebp and ensure that various open source projects are, are fussed. And we can do the exact same thing. Let's say we have Envoy, and we can see here that they have 63 different fuzzing harnesses, which is huge. And we can start to explore the code coverage report. And well, there's a lot of code, 1.6 million lines of code we can see. And we can just start to uh, analyze what more should be fussed, which in this case is 
is a lot, um, at least to get 100%. And we can also see like historical progressions. Um, I think we are out of time, so uh, I think with with that I'll I'll end and say integrate the projects into uh, OSS for and you will get these types of data. Uh, reach out to CNCF Fossing and we will help uh, develop fossils for you if you are running a, a CNCF project, and we will well help you get uh, continuous fussing into your CNCF project. And check also the handbook, please. It's a, it's a great reference if you want to kickstart your fussing uh, uh, pursuit. And drop by our bo booth in the project pavilion and learn more about fussing if you're interested. Thank you. I don't know if we have time for questions or if there are any questions. Um, I don't think there are any questions, but in any case, you can come to the Project Pavilion uh, if you're interested. We have a CNCF fasting booth. <laughs>